Okay, welcome everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the first, hopefully, of a series, regularly occurring series of uh, all Q&As for registered reports. Of course, the publishing model where peer review occurs before results are known and results are published regardless of outcome. With us today, um, I'm David Meller I'm the, from the Center for Open Science and Chris Chamber, Professor of Neuroscience at Cardiff University and Chair of the Registered Reports Committee. Uh, Chris, can you give a little explanation of why we're doing this? And then why we'll are we doing this? Very good question. Through. Thanks, David. So, um, welcome everybody. This is um, this is like registered reports for registered reports nerds. So, well, I've, I've, over the last six years, I've given perhaps two hundred talks on registered reports, and one of the common features of most of those talks has been there's never enough time for Q and A at the end, and it, and it goes on and on. One particular talk, you know, the Q and A lasted for 90 minutes after, um, after the presentation. So we, what we thought we'd do, what we, we thought we would try uh, is a, a format dedicated to like the Q and A session of a talk. Uh, and that means I won't be giving any introduction to registered reports themselves. Um, this is for people who are already familiar with the format. And, and indeed, if you go to the, the COS website or my talks page on the OSF, you can find plenty of slides introducing the format. But instead today, um, we thought we would, as I say, focus on Q&A. And in preparation uh, for this webinar, we sourced questions from, from you, from the community. Uh, some of them came from Twitter. Some of them, I think, were emailed directly to David. Uh, and we're going to work through them one by one and you know, talk about the issues surrounding them. Um, and as David says, this is all recorded, so you can come back to this later. Uh, and uh, you know, if you missed anything, and also the slides will be going up online. So I think that's enough for a, gen, you know, a, a very brief intro to why we're doing this. As I say, it's for, this is for the nerds. This is for the people who are in the process. Maybe they're thinking about um, launching registered reports at their journal. Maybe they're thinking about uh, a registered report they're writing. They're in the middle of the process now. It, I'm always happy to get really specific questions like, you know, reviewer one asked for this. How do, I, how do I do this in a registered report? Um, I've edited, I was just looked at the numbers today, I've edited 196 registered reports so far across seven journals in the last six years. So I've seen most um, variants of, of the process and things that can, you know, the challenges, the opportunities, things that go right, things that go wrong. So um, without further ado, uh, I suggest we move on to the questions. And just to say, if you have a question during the webinar, Jump in, ask it. Uh, I think David's going to be watching the, 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 the bar on the side here so we can, uh, we can catch those questions as they come up. Yeah. And we'll be keeping a close eye on that so that um, we can track that as we go along. So to our first question, uh, which I think this one is from a, a journal editor who is thinking of implementing registered reports. And they're asking, from the editor's point of view, how do you manage a registered report with OJS? So that's the, I think, open journal system. Uh, which is a, a, an open source uh, peer review uh, manuscript handling system or other stock peer review management platform. Is the second step a separate submission? How do you count time from submission to decision slash publishing? Now, the answer to this is it really depends. There's lots of different ways of doing this. When we, um, when we launched registered reports back in 2013 at Cortex, which is an Elsevier journal, we kind of jury rigged it so that um, Basically, we didn't change anything about the workflow. We simply added some new uh, guidelines on the website. We created a new article type, which was the same workflow as a regular research article, but had different instructions to reviewers, different template letters to um, decision letters to authors. And what we did is, and actually we still do this, um, um, is that we process that stage one submission as a regular manuscript. And when it gets to the point of in principle acceptance, we actually reject it, which might sound weird, but we technically, we reject it on the system. Of course, we tell the authors that they have their IPA, so everything's tickety-boo on that front, but we actually reject it technically on the system. And then what the authors do is they come back um, at stage two and they select stage two registered report from the drop-down list. And so the idea there is that there's two separate workflows, one for stage one and one for stage two. And, and the publisher at that time was quite keen on this because they were reluctant to incorporate the time that the authors took to actually do the research, i.e. between IPA and stage two submission uh, within their publication times, because they felt that um, that would actually make registered reports look extremely slow and would um, skew all of the various statistics that they use as KPIs. 
Um, I don't really care about those issues, but you know, this is what publishers care about. So you have to work with them. Um, so in that case, as I say, we had two different workflows and, uh, in terms of counting the time from submission to decision, it's simply a matter of doing that within each of those workflows as you would do for a regular article. Now that's how Elsevier do it. Um, at least that's how they do it for Cortex. Uh, there are other ways too. So um, at Royal Society Open Science, for example, uh, we use Scholar One. And for Scholar One, there's a, a more integrated workflow where uh, there's one pipeline for the entire stage one, stage two process. That's preferable if you have that facility within your management platform, because it's just, it's just better to have it in one audit trail. It makes inviting the reviewers back easier because you don't have to like search for them again on the system. They're just there waiting for you. There's little time savers. It's just better. It's a more, it's, it's a, just a better trail. Um, and I prefer that. So that's the better way of doing it. But really um, it's, it's even though the, the structure of the review process is very different from regular peer review in the sense that you have these two stages, uh, you have different letters, you have different criteria and so on. You can shoehorn it into the, into the old way, into the old um, management platform if you need to. And because all these management platforms seem to have been designed in like 1989 and never updated since then, um, they're so antiquated that it can be often quite challenging to, to go into them and, and try, you know, implementing revisions and innovations and they break very easily. So you may decide as an editor that it's easier just to work with the system you've got, get registered reports up and running. And in the meantime, perhaps work on perfecting um, a more integrated uh, workflow. And these uh, next series came from, a, a, uh, from one single lab and their colleagues. So some of them will be pretty similar. What's the average um, rough range or an estimate time taken for a stage one register report to go from submission to getting the first round of reviews back? This is a good question. I don't get this one very often. I often get the one where how long is it before I get my final decision? Yeah. How long before I get my first round of reviews? So I was looking up some statistics before, um, before joining today. And uh, it's, it's a little bit tricky to tell because when you submit to a journal, it doesn't always go to the editor immediately. Sometimes there's a, there's a buffer period in between where it goes through the journal admins who check it for very basic stuff. And so it's not always obvious to the editor how long that process has taken. So it usually takes about a week. So if we factor that in, if we allow a week for it to go through some kind of pre-editorial um, smoke test, does, it, you know, does, this, does this pass muster at a very, very basic level? Um, and then if the, at many journals, there's an additional kind of editorial triage stage where the editor looks at the manuscript um, in relation to the stage one criteria and says, does this sufficiently meet each of the stage one review criteria that it's not going to catch fire when I send it out for in-depth review? So if it's close enough to meeting those criteria, the editor will probably push it through to review. If it's falling significantly short in any one of those areas, like for example, insufficient methodological detail, insufficient linking between uh, hypotheses and analysis plan, that's this kind of thing. When, these, when, when there's not enough in those areas of the criteria, it often gets desk rejected. Um, so the fastest you can get a response back is, is often the one that I send at least half the time when a registered report comes in and I see that it's not gonna, it's not gonna do well in peer review until the issues X, Y, Z are, are addressed. And so what I do there is I typically desk reject that within about a week. Uh, and I ask for the authors to make various revisions um, in order for it to proceed further to in-depth review. Um, so that process overall can take one to two weeks to get past that desk stage. If you go into in-depth review, um, I ask reviewers to turn around registered reports, at least at the journals I edit for, for within 14 days. It never takes 14 days, what's well, rare. It usually takes longer. It takes time to find reviewers. It takes time for reviewers to accept review requests. Um, and then when they do accept, there's, they're often delayed and so on. So um, it, I would say the average, once you go into in-depth review, is probably about four weeks, maybe five, to get your first set of reviews back. Allow some time for uh, editors to look at it and make a decision. And you're probably looking at, I'd say, in total, if you went smoothly through the process and you read the guidelines very carefully and you avoid the obvious pitfalls, so my top 10 tips for how to avoid getting desk rejected. If you follow those closely, um, you're looking probably at about five, 
five weeks or so, five to six weeks for your first set of reviews back on average at the journals I edit for. Now, it's not always that quick at other journals. I know um, some journals are slower. Some journals like to get more reviews in. Um, they just have, different journals have their different uh, process to this. And I don't know all of the information at all the journals. I edit seven, soon to be six journals um, out of 208. So there's a lot that I don't cover. But typically, allow yourself about a month to a month and a half to go through that process. The fastest I've ever had was a few days when the reviewers just were like lightning speed and I was able to process that one and feel really good about myself. Um, and the slowest one I've had was 12 weeks and that was because of reviewers being very slow, um, saying they'll review, asking for delays, not being contactable, having to find other reviewers and so on. Um, so it can take, there is a range there, but you probably fall on average within that range about one, one to one and a half. What's the most time consuming thing that can be asked for the reviews in that first round of review? I think the most time consuming request or requirement is pilot data. So this can happen where the reviewers are not convinced about the feasibility of the, um, of the protocol for some reason, or maybe they're not convinced that the rationale is all in place. They may not be convinced that positive controls or manipulation checks have been uh, sufficiently established. There are various weak points which can be addressed often by doing preliminary studies. And, and that can be the most time consuming thing because obviously the authors then have a choice. They can either you know, try somewhere else or abandon doing a registered report altogether, or they can go away and actually do the preliminary studies and that can take as long as it takes them to do. Um, Aside from that, if those issues all check out, uh, and often you know, we get submissions where authors come in with pilot data already, so they've already addressed those issues before they come to us. Uh, the next, I suppose, most time consuming element would be just addressing all of those criteria. You know, so linkages between hypotheses, analyses, sampling plan, making sure it's all really, really clear. Uh, one of my um, top recommendations for authors is that you always include a table in your stage one registered report, which includes your hypothesis stated in terms of specific variables, your, um, your sampling plan, your analysis plan, and your contingent interpretation, depending on different outcomes of that test. And make sure it's all in a really clear chain because that can, that can avoid a lot of unnecessary discussion about what's unclear. You know, I mean, the reviewers often say, I don't understand clearly the link between this hypothesis and this set of analyses. And I think authors, if they come in without having thought those things through, they can go away and realize that in their own mind, they weren't even clear and that can elongate the process longer than it needs to be. So just making sure, again, it comes back to those top 10 tips that are in my in my guide, try and really nail those, those issues. Make sure you've absolutely ticked them off. And then if you've got your pilot data, if you, if you need it all in place and all of the other elements are there, it should be re relatively quick. Another uh, similar question, but um, average and rough range of time taken for a stage one rich report to go from revisions to getting accepted. That's usually pretty quick. So um, if you get to the revision stage of a registered report, You've, you're, you're almost certain to get IPA eventually. I think at least at the journals I edit for, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that too generally because there are, as I say, 190 something journals where I don't edit. But for those that I edit for, you've, you've pretty good chance of getting in because um, uh, you've, you've already achieved most of the criteria to even get to that point. Um, so there's two ways this can happen. Sometimes a revision comes in and it's so good and I don't need to send it back to the reviewers and you'll get an acceptance within days and sometimes hours. Uh, so more often than not though, um, when there's major revisions, it does have to go back to the reviewers and it's a bit quicker than the first round usually because they don't have to read the whole thing again. Um, there's a very high acceptance rate because the reviewers are already, when I say acceptance rate, I mean acceptance of the invitation to review. Um, because the reviewers have seen it already and they're invested in the process. I would say typically you're looking at about three to four weeks for, you know, from, from the time that you resubmit. Um, when you add all of that up, you're looking at around three months to go through the entire stage one process. And added to that, you're gonna be taking into account the time you take. So as an author, you're gonna have to go away and think about issues. So 
add that as well. Make sure you factor that into your timeline. I typically uh, ask authors to consider a four month window as being representative of the process. And that gets to one of the questions. It wasn't specifically submitted, but one of the frequently asked questions that we hear also a lot is you know, just how much time is this going to delay my project um, getting started? Because oftentimes one is eager to get started. Um, and, and this does by design take more review and focus and evaluation um, right up front uh, for very good reasons. But that is some of the take home message. That's right. It does take more time. Remember also you say that time comes back to you in the end. It's like, it's like putting money in the bank because when you get to the end of when you get your IPA, you know, you, you know, you're not going to get pretty much, no, you're not going to get rejected at stage two. So you're in a really strong position to get that research published quickly. So you're investing time up front, but you're really getting it back at the end because you're not going to have to go from one journal to the next to the next. Um, is there data available on the length of time to go through these processes in general by journal or by subfield? So some of the things here. This data yeah. doesn't exist in any uh, organized form at the moment. It's mostly me talking. Um, Anna Scheel works with Daniel Larkins in Eindhoven has uh, data on this um, for Cortex that I sent her and she's analyzing it at the moment. And there, I suspect are more such studies in the pipeline looking at how long it takes. And then once that data is out there, we can start carving it up into, you know, um, genres, specialties, journals, and so on. And I actually think this is really important information because one of the uh, key uh, deciding factors for an author as to where they submit could very well be how fast is this journal. And I think journals should be transparent about that process as much as possible. One of the challenges I should say from an editorial point of view is, it, is it's quite tricky to actually calculate these times. Again, because the manuscript handling software was all designed in the 90s. It dumps you out this really uninformative statistics as an editor, which doesn't capture really the information you want at the granularity that you want. So we often find ourselves having to do this stuff manually, which is not good and very time consuming. I think, which is one reason this data isn't more available, um, but I hope it will become more available. I, the, as I say, the, the overall time frame you should allow is in the order of three to four months to go through the entire stage one process. We don't know really how that differs by journal or subfield yet. If designing an intervention study, there's no data collected during the intervention, only before and after it, how specified does that intervention itself need to be? This is a good question. Um, and it's interesting because this is actually a lot of registered reports fall into this category. You know, it's quite common that, an in, that there'll be no data collected during an intervention. If it's an independent variable, it's just something that is done to somebody or to, you know, to an animal or to whatever. And then you measure before and after. Um, this is typical experimental design. And so, you know, the answer is it needs to be fully specified because um, it's crucial that every element of a registered report is reproducible. Um, and that's kind of one of the fundamental principles of registered reports, you know, in general. And I would argue that it should be the case for all publishing. But the, the thing that you learn as an editor, as a reviewer, as an author within the world of registered reports is that to properly assess a stage one manuscript under all the criteria that we assess them by, you really need to have that level of detail in there. And so I would always recommend um, having more information rather than less. If you're not sure whether it should go in, put it in. If you think it really disrupts the flow of the manuscript to have all that detail, put it in supplementary information, but still put it in. A big one right here, but they're describing a, a two phase project. Phase two is suitable for the registry report, but the measure employed will, be, will depend on which measures um, in phase one, a separate study uh, are significant predictors of performance. In order to submit the phase two as a register report and still be within the timeline of the grant, we would need to submit at stage one at a point in which we know what potential me measures we'll use. And we know the criteria for determining which measures we'll include, but we don't yet have that phase one data to determine which one is which. Would you be able to list the potential measures that we will include and state exactly how we will determine which to include and why? The short answer is yes. So in this situation, you could do what we call like a contingent design 
where you would say, you would actually submit the registered report now and you would say, step one, uh, which you could build into the protocol or, you know, for stage one review, or you could, uh, you could have a separate, and it's not part of the actual protocol, but it's something separate, like separately pre-registered. Maybe it's already underway, which is fine. But you could build into that, that process, into that phase two protocol, which forms the core of the registered report. You have options. So th there's presumably a finite number of, of measures um, that will go into phase two. And you'll have in your mind, you must have already, a series of decisions that you're going to make in the future about if this, then I will do that. If this, then I'll do that. But if this, I will, then I'll do that. And so if you can operationalize it with that level of granularity, then the, the best approach is simply to build that a decision tree into your register report. Uh, and then um, when you get your IPA, you can just follow the, follow the tree and, and, uh, and see what happens. And when you come back um, with your, phase two data, you will have completed one path in that, in that tree. So it's very doable. We don't get a lot of submissions that propose that kind of thing. Usually they, um, usually they have a more formulated and hardwired sort of protocol, but there's absolutely nothing stopping you from doing it. Indeed, the, where we tend to see this more often is with analysis plans where someone will say, depending on the distribution of the data, we might do this type of analysis or we might do that type of analysis. Uh, it tends to, you tend to, tend to see that kind of uh, contingency built more into the analysis side, but it's just as doable at the design stage, provided um, your phase one is sufficiently developed that you know, in, you know what you're going to be putting into that contingency. So you need to have some kind of bedrock underneath it, which will now enable you to, to build that contingency table. Yeah. And I think the reviewers will have to be able to see that that's being done in a very rigorous way and just convince that skeptical reviewer that that decision is not going to be made in any sort of biased way. That's right. And then what, you know, one of the things the reviewers might do is start critiquing the phase one element. So you, it's, it, it's almost advantageous in this situation to, to, to submit phase one and phase two together as one registered report and revise them all at the same time um, so that you can get your phase one element approved and you can update that uh, uh, as you're also updating your contingency. So you do them all together in a way, because if you do that, you avoid the problem of having started your phase one and there's no turning back now. Some reviewer says fatal flaw, uh, the contingency that you've put in place doesn't make any sense. The, this therefore must be rejected. That would be a situation where an editor would be left in a position where they might have to just outright reject because there's an, now an element of the design which is fundamentally unrevisable. Cool. Right. This one is kind of a, talking about scientific culture and, and how we disseminate and publish surprising findings. What's the ideal vision for balancing a breaking news finding that deserves lots of attention but by their very nature are less likely to be confirmed in later studies, so very exploratory preliminary findings. The current system encourages hyping of those findings, um, and one manifestation of that is high impact factor journals. Um, but if that is a, to be diminished, how will we attract attention to those potentially important findings that deserve lots of attention in the research community? Is it simply a matter of resetting our expectations? I think it is, and I, I, this, this touches on a lot of issues about incentives and <clears throat> newsworthiness, journal rank. <clears throat> there's a lot of issues to unpack in this question. I think, and because of that, you know, you're gonna find a lot of views on this, and there's no reason why my view should hold any particular weight. However, one thing I will say, first of all, registered reports do not eliminate journal rank. Journal rank will always be there so long as there are journals, because that's human nature. Um, if we eliminate journals, of course, we eliminate journal rank, but as long as we have journals, there are people will find some journals more prestigious than others. Prestige is something that's baked into the academic culture at the moment. Um, but I do also think that resetting expectations is important here about what justifies a piece of scientific research for newsworthiness in the first place. Because at the moment, newsworthiness, at least in the vision of this question and more generally as well, is thought to be demonstrated based on outcomes. So you meet some minimum standard in terms of methodology and question, get an amazing outcome and it's newsworthy. And registered reports shake this up really because they say at the core really, what makes a piece of research 
valuable, important, high quality, newsworthy even, is when you might get an amazing finding, but you can also show that it's not the product of reporting bias. We don't take it, that into account enough, in my opinion. In my opinion, it, you know, we, what we need to reset expectations about is how newsworthy a finding ought to be when it's proven um, or at least suspected to be the product of reporting bias. And I would suggest that in those situations, it shouldn't be that newsworthy. At one point in a talk I gave in London on um, open science for controversial research, I, I, I presented this kind of pyramid, this hierarchy of evidence that I think makes sense in that context where, you know, typical sort of um, status quo research is really rarely what, uh, particularly in controversial fields, is in my opinion, rarely um, deserving of newsworthiness. What's deserving of the newsworthy um, label is really when it's, when it's replicated, when it's meta-analyzed, when it's shown to be reliable and demonstrable. Um, that said, you know, I can say what should happen till the cows come home. It's not gonna be the case. I think we have to accept that newsworthiness is still gonna be a factor. Some outcomes will always generate more news than others. The best thing we can do with registered reports is treat all such papers the same at the level of the journal. The scientific record is not the newspaper. And I think one of the mistakes that we, we allow in science is conflating the scientific record with, with, new, with news reporting. They are different. And I think registered reports help to separate those two worlds. And finally, the thing I would say is that registered reports are not designed for the purely exploratory science that often leads to findings that generate a huge amount of impact. Oh, I found this amazing, unexpected thing. Um, I wasn't, I didn't even, you know, I wasn't, didn't even have a study going or I just saw something, I observed something. That type of research is always going to be there. It's always important. It's always valuable. And it will always be newsworthy. The question is, how much weight do you put in it until it's being verified? And that's the balancing act, the rebalancing, I suppose, of, of science that registered reports are trying to establish. Yeah, and I know Cortex and a few others are specifically labeling or inviting submissions to authors to specifically label exploratory results with you know, very little expectation about replicability, but, um, but specifically right. designed for completely unanticipated findings. Um, so we have a format of Cortex, as David says, called exploratory reports, which is the kind of yin to the registered reports yang. So this format is all about um, generating hypotheses from data. And it's not about, there's no pre-registration. There's, we discourage inferential statistics really of any kind. Um, although, you know, authors can report them if they want, but we, we, we try to steer authors away from making conclusions about what they think is real and more about using the data to generate questions that can be answered in future studies using, you know, the hypothesis driven method. So completing that deductive cycle. I also think this um, question speaks to the, you know, the potential strength of preprints. Um, authors, reviewers, even journal, um, journalists um, often preface um, findings reported in a preprint with a, this has not yet been peer reviewed, taking that peer review as kind of the gold standard of scientific credibility. Um, and it would be great to hijack that skepticism a little bit with um, you know, unconfirmed findings or, or unregistered findings uh, um, can be you know, quickly and easily disseminated via, via preprints, waiting for the higher level of rigor and evidence um, provided by the, the full register report format. Yes, I think so. And I think, you know, certainly tagging articles as to whether they've been replicated. Yeah, or so a lot to go in there, obviously. Kind of going backwards through the, the scientific record and saying, has this result been replicated? And then badging that maybe onto previous papers would be a really neat thing. Unfortunately, I keep coming back to this, you know, the way the journals work, the way the scientific record is accumulated is again stuck in the 1990s where, you know, you get this fixed PDF record, which is very difficult to update. So we need to really think about the future of publishing, the future of communicating science if we're going to develop those kinds of innovations. This is a paraphrase from a, a series of tweet questions. A really interesting question. They had submitted a, a registered report in the first review. Reviewers requested a manipulation check. Fair enough. If you don't know, that's just a way to demonstrate that the proposed manipulation had the intended effect or that it was done in a competent manner. Now, in the second round of review, interestingly, reviewers are asking for a pre-specified plan as to what we will do if the manipulation checks don't pan out. 
I'm finding this harder question, obviously, uh, than it seemed at first. I mean, if manipulation checks don't work out, you have to pretty much go home, right? There's not much point to running the main analyses if you believe that you didn't even successfully manipulate the thing you were trying to manipulate. So I guess I'm thinking here there has to be a middle way. Perhaps a plan can be if manipulation check fails, we'll still run some planned analyses, but purely for exploratory reasons. It will not consider results supporting our theories. What else do you have here? This is a good question. This is one that um, comes up a lot actually with registered reports because re manipulation checks, positive controls uh, in clinical research is referred to as intervention fidelity. <clears throat> These are the only aspect of the results that could theoretically lead to a rejection at stage two. It's never actually happened, but it's possible that if a, if a, if a study was run in such a way that the authors couldn't show that the intervention was even applied properly or that there was some, you know, something failed in, a, in, an, in a, uh, uh, an outcome neutral check in such a way that the study was almost pointless, then that could in, in theory lead to stage two rejection. Now, in reality, you got to ask yourself as an author, what are, review, what are reviewers trying to get hold of when they ask you to report manipulation checks? And when they ask you for contingencies about what you will do when they don't work out, they're actually throwing you a lifeline. Because remember that failure of a manipulation check at stage two can result in rejection. So if you're in a position where you're able to say what you'll do, you're also therefore in a world where that, the failure of that check won't lead to rejection because otherwise they might, they might say nothing you go ahead and, and run the study, your manipulation check fails and you get bounced, which is theoretically possible. So what I suggest doing in this situation is always having, think of it like a, a layered insurance policy. Your manipulation check <coughs> is your highest level insurance policy. That's the one where if that passes, you're absolutely rock solid because your intervention, whatever it is, has been shown to have the necessary fidelity. It was applied in such a way that the hypotheses that you, that you propose are testable. But if it fails, all is not lost. What you wanna then have is another layer below that of insurance, which is how, if my manipulation check failed, how would I convince a skeptical reviewer that I, I ran my study to a high quality? So, you know, if I was giving some kind of drug to one group and a uh, placebo to the other, and my manipulation check on you know, some known effect of that drug didn't pan out, how would I convince a reviewer that actually gave the drugs to the correct groups in the correct dose, et cetera? So think about how you would actually demonstrate that. You know, in some studies we get, that might consist of demonstrating that signal to noise ratio in an EEG study is within a specified margin um, and, uh, or you know, some other demonstration of lack of floor or ceiling effects. So think of it like a, a, lay, a series of layered um, checks where the lowest level one will be the one that if that doesn't pan out, you're not sure if, if the study was run at a level that you're satisfied that you'd want to publish anyway. And we have never had a case in all my editing of, of the lowest level check not panning out. What we have had, and is very interesting, is a couple of cases where manipulation checks have failed, but the lower level checks have passed. And what that tends to suggest is that the thing that you think is real, that your manipulation check is tapping into, may not be as real as you think it is. So it could be that the, um, the, the reality check that your manipulation check relies on is in fact not as reliable as you thought. And that, that can happen because you know, we work in a field where there's a lot of unreliable research. We don't have key benchmarks in every area that we can always push against. Um, so it's not a disaster to have a manipulation check fail, but ask yourself how reliable in your heart of hearts do you believe that manipulation check to be? How much do you believe that particular result um, will pan out if the study is run correctly? If you, have, if you suspect bias in the literature, which has shown that particular effect before, or there's some other reason why you think it might be unreliable, again, build in the lower level insurance. Um, and if you do that, then you can, that can be your outcome neutral check that determines or, or could determine whether your manuscript passes stage one and then later stage two review. This is the last one that was pre-submitted. We've got at least four questions in the queue uh, that have been submitted through our Brilliant. question and answer format. So do you think there is a risk of predatory or suboptimal 
register report journals? Um, and if yes, how could these be policed? And there's two possible ways to do this, not honoring the in-principle acceptance or giving a poor stage one peer review. So let's answer that in two stages. First of all, predatory journals. <coughs> I can't stop predatory journals. Can you, David? I don't know. Yeah, predatory, predatory journals, you know, they're like, they're just a thing. And I think we have to just avoid them because to be honest with you, if they're so easy to spot really most of the time that it should be straightforward to avoid them. One of the very basic things that we do to, we haven't encountered this situation yet, but if a predatory journal, an obvious predatory journal, um, like one of those ones that says greetings to the day when it emails you. If one of those started offering registered reports, um, we would probably not add it to the COS list. Or at least if we did, we would flag it in some way as potentially predatory. We would do something to keep you informed. So every journal that's on that list at the Center for Open Science, cos.io forward slash RR, every one of those journals, we believe is not predatory. So that's actually, if you just go by that guide, that's a fairly easy filter that you can apply in addition to your own judgment. I think most scholars who have got past a certain level in their career um, know how to avoid predatory journals. The second one is a little bit more tricky, suboptimal RR journals. This is, a, this is something that we, uh, this, is, this is a greater risk. So this is where the journal itself is respectable, but it's just not doing a good job editing registered reports. It's either, it's, you know, when, when, when we came up with this format six years ago, I was very careful to make sure that the policy was quite detailed because I, I knew that it would probably be cannibalized by a lot of other journals. And so if you build all that detail in at ground zero, then it, that will be propagated across the area. And so you will see a lot of the journals that offer registered reports use the text from our original policy. That's good if they follow the policy. If they follow that policy, then it should be fairly consistent across the board, but they may not follow the policy. It is always possible that editors will not honor an IPA or they will um, reject a manuscript at stage one for bad reasons or at stage two for bad reasons, or that they will, um, you know, there's one journal that comes to mind, which has a, a, an implicit policy of always rejecting stage one manuscripts that require any revisions whatsoever which just seems bonkers to me. I mean, the whole purpose of registered reports is to, is to um, improve, you know, eliminate bias, but also improve the designs as, you know, through review. So what's the point of going through that process and then just bouncing them if they're not perfect? Um, technically, that's within the rules. A journal can do that because it can decide at stage one. It can reject on those criteria. It doesn't have to ask for it. It doesn't have to allow authors to revise. But I would say that's suboptimal. So the best way of monitoring all of this is for the community to tell us when it happens. We have some very, very early stage plans for a website um, where researchers could rate journals based on their registered report experience, where they could leave specific feedback about what they liked and didn't like about the review process at that journal. Maybe they could even talk about how long the process took. You could gather various information from the community and then you could create a league table you create some competition between the journals and all of a sudden you've got a marketplace and then I think things will become more transparent and then we can address um, some of those suboptimal elements more transparently. In the other hand, whilst we've got that sort of stick and maybe carrot in this hand, I think we need to be training editors better in how to do this kind of editing. And in a way that's depressing because for me, editing a registered report is really just editing a regular paper in two stages. So if you can't do a registered report, I'm not quite sure how you're able to edit a paper with results. Um, so that's, that's a little frightening to me. However, that it, it also must be accepted that there are some, some, some unique challenges in editing registered reports, which some editors are not familiar with, like maybe some of the statistical requirements, you know, maybe some of the deeper thinking about theory and rationale. Maybe they're not used to doing that. Maybe they're just used to going straight to the results section and making judgments on, on that basis. So we need better training materials for editors. And this is also something that we're in the process of developing. And that could include, you know, um, vignettes and possible even accreditation uh, that an editor could get to show that they've passed some kind of test or a series of tests for, for properly editing registered reports. Put all of those things together, and I think you can create an environment where you've got some control over the non-predatory yet suboptimal practices that are almost inevitable almost inevitably going to going to happen because as this thing scales up, it goes out of my control. I only edit, as I say, seven journals. It's going to go out of my control and it's going to be something that the community needs to start monitoring. 
Um, and I would say for both of those, um, information is key. Information gathering is key. So if you see something going on, if you feel like an IPA wasn't honored, we are happy to advise and uh, see what's possible for either of those situations. Yeah, you know, I get a lot of email like this. You know, I probably get at least an email every week or two from someone. It's not always complaining about a bad experience, but it's often, you know, like I've, I've got this situation. I don't know what to do. This review has asked me to do this X, Y, Z. What's your advice on this? And so I do a lot of that sort of stuff through back channels. But um, I think it would be nice, actually, if more of that sort of uh, dialogue was public because then everyone can learn from it and it, become, it can become a knowledge base. So I would encourage you to share your registered reports experiences as publicly as you're able to do, even if do some anonymous way as much as you can because then others will learn and you'll also learn from from their experiences we have uh, four submitted questions right now on the the chat we, we have time for plenty of them if you have others anyone listening feel free to submit some more um, but let me go down the list where we have please can you give guidelines on searching the literature to find pre-registered studies um, Chris, and I can. Well, okay. So if you mean registered reports, then um, there's there's one way you can you can find them is to go to the Zotero database, and I'm sure David will post a link to that yeah. um, in response. So there's a the Center for Open Science curates a, a database of stage two registered reports that have been published, which is not comprehensive, uh, and it and it, it is manually updated, so you can't rely on it as being the definitive guide. But it's got a lot, and it's um, and it's growing all the time. So that's good. So that's one place you can go to find them. Um, you can also just set up a Google Scholar alert for the word registered report or registered reports. You'll get a lot of false positives. Um, you know, of people talking about registered reports, more and more people talk about them in their articles, but you will also pick up the ones that are called registered reports. Um, and the other, if you, if you also mean stage one registered reports rather than the completed, um, you know, full stage two, articles, you can go to the OSF registries page, and I'm sure David can post a link to that as well, where you can filter for registered report protocols that have been accepted at stage one. This is a really good resource. I send my students to this, and on the master's course that I teach, I, I, I send the students to that too, because it, it um, shows you what an accepted stage one submission really looks like, which is terrible. I think it really useful and a little bit more useful than a completed stage two article because the stage two article of course also includes the results and discussion and there can be minor changes to the front end but to really get a, a grip on what it takes to get a stage one manuscript um, accepted it's really good to look at the accepted stage ones that are out there and as i say you can find that on the osf registry and there are links to all of those um, on the registered report website and i'll send that out right now also cos.io slash rr. And we'll send links to all of these too, to all attendees. All right. Um, Chris, you mentioned including a table detailing the links between the hypothesis, the analysis, and the possible interpretations. Are there any good examples of that that we can look for? Um, there are. So there are some published examples of that. I couldn't think of any particular study to mind um, because my brain doesn't work that well. But there's, there, are, there are examples out there that have, do, that have done this. And you'll see more of them coming through because it's something I regularly ask authors for now. And so most submissions that I edit actually end up with this in it. But of course, there's a delay you know, between that going through the pipeline and being coming out the other end. Um, that said, you don't really need an example of this. So you think about it logically. So you've got question. And that there might be a research question here, and then next to that, the hypotheses, you know, list them one by one, maybe one each row. And then the, the analysis plan. Now, maybe you've got multiple analyses for each hypothesis, which is okay. In which case, what combination of tests will give you what outcome? Then you, you might have your power analysis, your sampling plan for that specific test. Always make sure that your sampling plan is linked to the exact test that will test your hypothesis. It's a big mistake people often make in a registered report, having that too fluffy. Um, make sure that's there. And then contingent interpretation at the end. What will different outcomes mean? It's, you can map this out on a whiteboard. It's, it's one of those things that um, I would encourage everyone to do, really, whether or not you're doing a registered report or not. It's just a good process to go through, I think, when you're designing an experiment. Um, but you will find examples in the literature. We can probably dig some up after this webinar, but you know, 
fundamentally, it's also an element of logic to that. Yeah, there's a, one of the big points is, is simple clarity, um, using the same basic words, the, the variable names that are used in the analyses as closely as possible in the hypotheses just to avoid ambiguity there. You, know, you can always have two columns. I've seen this also where um, you have one column, which is the kind of prose description of the hypothesis. And the next one linked to that, that cell next one along will be the, the oper operationalization of that hypothesis in terms of specific variables in an equation, essentially. Um, and that's really nice because then you've got an equation, then that links to an analysis, then that links to a sampling plan, then that links to an interpretation. So if you can build that chain of very specific granularity with such precision that you could just throw data into this and an answer comes out the other end. That's kind of what you're looking for. All right. This question, what is the usual journal policy about news or media coverage of the study before stage two acceptance? Are you familiar with any of those? Before stage two acceptance. So this is interesting. So this is when presumably the question here is about um, preprints. So this is about pre. So this is a, this essentially falls into the world of a standard preprint, so. where there's results exist. So it's obviously potentially newsworthy, um, but uh, the the stage two article hasn't been accepted. So let's assume you have published your stage two manuscript as a preprint, which you can always do. Um, at least in our field, I think virtually every journal and indeed every uh, registered report adopting journal that I know of is preprint friendly. So you could always submit your stage two manuscript as a preprint. And indeed, you can do it all the way through. So there's just to go off piece for a second. I mean, there are some researchers who just put their, that Ben Jones does this, he puts his stage one protocol up and he keeps revising it and it's basically stage two. And you can just track it through version control all the way through to the end. Um, it's the, I, the same, it'll be the same policy for media coverage and embargoes for that, for a stage two registered report, as which will apply to a regular research article at that journal. The journal's embargo policy, if they have one, will not discriminate between registered reports and regular articles. So for example, if you publish a registered report in Nature Human Behaviour, you're welcome to publish a preprint if um, you get you probably want to talk, I would talk, some of the more high impact journals might be a bit twitchy. So I would talk to the editor about potential news exposure that you want to generate before acceptance, just to be sure that uh, that's not going to violate their embargo policy more generally, um, because that could endanger acceptance in a very strange way. I don't think it's ever happened, but you know, it could happen. But you know, basically treat it like a regular article, look at the journal's embargo policy. I had a couple of questions about um, registered reports and grants and timelines. Do you know of any cases where a grant was submitted without a registered report in mind, but once awarded, the applicants realized that it would be ideal for an RR, but the timeline of the grant doesn't accommodate doing it. Do you know of anyone who has gone back to the funding body to ask to extend the life um, of the grant and the associated costs um, and of giving a rationale about the benefits of you know, assuming that yeah, they were convincing about that. That's There's a follow-up really question, question, but yeah, start there. That's what a great question. No, is the answer. <laughs> it's a really good, I mean, it's one of those situations when you put all of those contingencies together, the answer is no. I've heard of different yeah. parts of that being the case. You know, I've had, I've got a grant myself, which I submitted, which uh, wasn't going to be a registered report, but ended up being one. Um, there's also cases I know of where people want to do registered reports, but the timeline doesn't quite work for them. I, what I don't know of, is a situation where anyone's gone back to a funding agency to say, can I have some more money? It's usually quite difficult to do that ever, <laughs> in my experience. Like you tend to have cash limited grants and yeah. going back to a funder and saying, hey, please may I have some more gruel, so like a like Oliver Twist. It doesn't tend to really work. Um, that said, you never know till you ask. And some of these funders, particularly the smaller ones that may be more flexible and not so bogged down in pages and pages of policies and procedures, they might, they might be open to that. Um, I think this is a, the, the, what this question highlights for me is that the, the importance of registered reports funding model themselves, because they solve all of these problems. You know, if you can, if you could submit your stage one registered report to a journal and to a funder at the same time, you can tie all of these processes together and get rid of all of this risk of things running out of time and, you know, different stage one processes not, um, not being compatible and so on. And this is something that Marcus Manafo and, me and, and others are working on at the moment. But um, in the meantime, I, if, you, if you're in a situation where this is a scenario you're facing, 
I'd be very interested to hear more about that because it's possible that with our collective influence um, of the COS and, and um, being involved in registered reports that we could always approach a funder um, as some kind of team and say, you should consider at a very general level this a, a particular change to your policy, which would enable more flexibility for researchers to do registered reports. There, there's always scope to change policies uh, virtually anywhere if you've got a good enough case for it. Yeah, and the follow-up question, uh, you, you just answered it. You know, how, um, how could grants or registered reports go together better? And that's exactly where the editorial review and the potential funding review can rely on those same set of expert reviewers. And um, if accepted by both, you get the decision that the, the work will be funded and published regardless of outcome um, right. simultaneously. So anonymous attendee at 3.47 p.m. nailed that. So that yeah. is absolutely right. And that, that is why we created the Reg Supports funding model. So if you go to the cos.io forward slash RR and you go to the four funders tab, I think it's called the four funders tab. Yes, it is. Um, you will find a list of the current uh, registered report funders or funding models that are available. Um, it's a very short list at the moment in very specific fields, but uh, it's worth having a look just at the, the, the um, you know, the style of it. And, and I think we need more of these and it's something we're certainly looking at understanding more and promoting. And if I could pass on this, just sort of an anecdote or a series of anecdotes, anecdata. There's a lot of enthusiasm by the research funded community about pre-registration in general and registered reports in particular. Um, and they very much want to encourage the process and are working to dot their I's and cross their T's. So, um, but if they were to receive a question, um, you, I, you know, I wanna add this process to the workflow. Um, list a couple of the benefits that they, many of them are quite familiar with it, uh, but, but haven't quite figured out the way to require it or to, to make it more of a common thing. Um, that I, I very much expect that those types of questions would be well received. Absolutely. Of course, always um, ask. asking for more money is tough, but yeah. always ask. I totally agree. Always ask because um, if lots of people ask for a thing, they take, they start paying attention. And sometimes if you know, they get one question and you know, it can lead to a change in policy, a change of thinking. Um, that it's possible to change almost il any element of this um, with time and, you know, with, with pressure. Um, so, yes, definitely. All right, Chris, what are your experiences um, with reservations of journal editors and society officials towards adopting the register report format for their journals? Any insights as to how to best preempt these and win over the skeptics? This wow, this is a whole nother one hour webinar. Let's go, right. <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, it's a very, this is a question I get a lot from, um, from editors actually, who, who uh, encounter barriers within their own editorial boards or they get blocked higher up. So they might be on an editorial board and they want to do registered reports. They might even be a chief editor, but then they go to some publications committee of essentially academic bureaucrats who then say, no, we don't like it. Or they don't even, you don't even know why they don't like it. They just say no. Um, and why? So why, why do journals say no? I have somewhere a bingo board on this. I think we should add it. If, we, <laughs> if we've got a website uh, for, this, for these slides, let's put my bingo board up. There's all kinds of reasons I've had from editors and societies over the years of why they don't want to do registered reports. They will perhaps... I think a lot of them are fallacious. So they might say, well, registered reports don't fit all of the research in our field. Therefore, we're not going to offer them as an option for anyone within our field, which is really a bit disingenuous because no article type at any journal ever suits everybody in the field uh, all of the time. So, you know, to limit an article type on that basis is pretty, pretty illogical. Um, I think perhaps the greatest objection you, I've come across is really just various forms of um, publication bias. So essentially, particularly higher impact journals um, get their brands in large part by selecting what gets published based on the results. And the, 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 obviously the core of the registered reports model is that it takes away the power of the editor to say which results they prefer to publish over others, which results are worthy of my prestigious journal. And that power, if, you're, if you are a journal whose reputation relies on publication bias, 
and whose impact factor perhaps relies on publication bias, you'll be less disposed perhaps toward offering this format than if you're a, jo a journal editor who actually um, tries their best to select what gets published based on quality and looks at results because of course regular articles always have them, but tries to make the best judgment scientifically. And those sorts of journal editors tend to be much more open to the idea. Now, the other thing is that a lot of editors don't like admitting that publication bias is the reason why they, um, they are resistant to registered reports because they know that that's an unpopular opinion and I might talk about it. So what they often do is they, 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 um, they kind of use smoke and mirrors and you get a whole lot of bullshit like, oh, our computer system can't handle it or our editors are too busy. You get, you know, I, I'm not the only editor who's come across these, uh, these issues. There's some wonderful blog posts that have been written by editors of other journals who go to their chief editors and say, um, would you like to do registered reports? I'll do all the work, I'll do all of this. And they get a no for reasons that are very obviously publication bias, but uh, are not phrased in such a way. Um, how do we preempt these and win the skeptics over? Well, you know, um, step one can show as much as possible that, that the impact of a registered report is, is so great that you don't need results to go, out a, to go a certain way in order for um, them to do well within the journal. And we actually have the first evidence from citations, for example, that that's the case. So uh, work by Lily Hummer and colleagues at the COS. I don't know if you're even on that paper, are you, David? You might be. Uh, so they've got no, a, I'm not. Not, but um, it's your colleagues over there which have shown that um, that registered reports are cited comparably to regular articles, uh, or even possibly slightly higher within the journals in which they appear. Which is the best evidence you can give to a fussy journal editor who cares about their impact factor and is worried that accepting a whole lot of papers with quite possibly negative results will lead to them publishing a whole lot of boring studies that nobody will read. That doesn't seem to be the case based on what we know so far. And in fact, if you go to our, uh, the COS webpage, in amongst the FAQs, you can find a, uh, a two page pitch to editors, which addresses these questions head on. Yeah, and I think it gets to one other thing. The, the proposal of a registered report is, is essentially asking the journal saying, this research question is so important that it deserves to be addressed regardless of outcome. And that's kind of a high hurdle to to get over. Um, so the, the type of work being submitted here is, is not boring work that we all know the answers to already. It's, it's to questions that there are really burning questions. So um, yeah. you know, at least in the past couple of years, there it hasn't been a tsunami of boring, boring work. It's, it's been the pressing research that deserves a, um, you know, the register report treatment. And it's often high, high risk research, you know? Well, it's interesting back in the early days when we launched this format, people thought, well, the only types of articles you get submitted to registered reports are really, really, really incremental research or replications, um, you know, because that's the only time maybe that people would be prepared to go down this road. In fact, you get everything. So you, I, I get a lot of submissions of people proposing quite out there hypotheses. And the reason it makes perfect sense, if, um, if, you're, if you've got a really important question, but a really uh, severe test, a high risk hypothesis, um, which could turn out null, but if it doesn't, well, it could be really interesting, you know, if it's, if it's supported, that it could have major implications. That can get through the registered reports process fine, um, as long as the question is important enough and the method is robust enough. So we get a lot of submissions like that, testing risky predictions. Um, what would be very interesting to know is whether the predictions in registered reports are fundamentally more or less risky than in regular articles. And that's a meta scientific question that I know some people are currently studying. Get on that everyone. All right, we are just about out of time. I will uh, conclude this uh, first, hopefully in a series, uh, webinar of all Q and A for registered reports, a success. And um, be on the lookout for information coming your way if you're registered for the webinar. We'll send you links to slides and a couple of resources mentioned throughout this. Chris, thank you as always for your time. And everyone, thank you for logging on. Thanks for joining us.